So good afternoon. I think many of you know me, but I'm Danuta Nitetsky, Dean of Libraries, and I'm pleased to welcome you to our spring 2021 scholarship event. So scholarship was launched in 2011 as part of the library's strategic goal to help build cross-disciplinary community at Drexel and to connect members of the university community to scholarship. Each academic quarter, the event brings together faculty and professional staff from all colleges, schools, and many administrative departments. And more recently, particularly through or doing it through Zoom, um, more students, alumni, and members of the community as, to, as well have joined us for a food for thought discussions, focusing on interdisciplinary research conducted at the university and for a shared toast to the end of the academic term. So this term, we have much to toast. After 14 months of working together to slow the spread of COVID-19 by wearing masks and practicing social distancing, we are now seeing a steady drop in the number of newly reported cases of coronavirus. So in fact, as you all know, last week, the city of Philadelphia just ended all safer at home restrictions, except some mask wearing requirements, just in time for Drexel's university-wide commencement ceremony this Friday. President Fry and Provost Jensen also announced a full return to campus and the quote, new normal operations starting with the fall terms. It now seems very likely we will indeed see many of you in person for the first scholarship event of the 2021 and 2022 academic year this December. So we, re we recognize December must feel like a long way away and we will continue to be flexible and adapt based on any new guidance from the University, City of Philadelphia, and the CDC. So fittingly, with the end of the pandemic restrictions in sight, we also welcome the end of this 20, 2020, 2021 <laughs> academic year's scholarship series, which is focused on responding to COVID-19 through research and scientific problem solving. In December, 2020, Usama Bila, Assistant Professor in the Dornsite School of Public Health, set the stage for the year with a food for thought discussion about his research into how COVID-19 has amplified societal inequities. Professor Bilal and his team have conducted global research on how different populations have been affected by COVID-19 based on country, age, and ethnicity, and the impact of this virus over time, concluding that healthcare inequalities are worse after the COVID-19 pandemic than they were before. In March, 2021, Dr. Esther Cernak, Associate Clinical Professor and the Director of the Center for Health, Public Health Readiness and Communication, spoke about her research on the disaster communication needs of families who have children with special health care challenges and the impact COVID-19 has had on these families. And as Stacy said, both of these are recorded, so we can certainly direct you if you missed those, you can still sit down and listen. And now I'm pleased to say a few words about today's speaker. Drexel College of Engineering Professor Christopher Salas, who will close out this year's scholarship series with a discussion on his applied research with SEPTA to prevent the spread of COVID on public transportation. This timely collaboration will continue to be important as the city works to contain COVID-19 and researchers and practitioners alike look for ways to control the spread of deadly viruses in the future. Chris is an associate professor in the civil, architectural, and environmental engineering department at Drexel University. With research expertise in environmental microbiology, environmental biotechnologies, and environmental remediation technologies. He is also an affiliated research at the CNJ Nineheim Plasma Institute of Drexel University, where he collaborates on the research and development of innovative non-thermal plasma technologies for food safety, public health, and environmental applications. Prior, coming, prior to coming to Drexel, Chris received his MS and his PhD in civil and engin environmental engineering from the University of California, Berkeley. He also did undergraduate research at the University of Pennsylvania, working on novel bioreactors for wastewater treatment. So we really thank you very much again for joining us today, Chris. This is terrific. And I guess I didn't plug in there too. He's a, he's a a strong advocate and member of our library advisory group for a few years and has been terrific in that course as well. So, but before I turn the Zoom co-host function over to Professor Salas, let us continue our scholarship tradition and virtually toast the end of the spring 2021 term. So rise, raise whatever you have, virtual or real containers for a toast to the end of this term. And as I often remind those of you who have to teach, uh, who have to evaluate exams and still mark them, be kind, 
<laughs> be generous to your students and let's just get everybody through this academic year. Here's to 2021's term. All right, Chris. All right, thanks Danuta. Yours. <laughs> thanks Danuta for the introduction and thanks Stacy for setting this up. So let me share some slides. Um, I have about 25 slides. I think I probably got carried away because I'm a professor making slides, um, but feel free to ask questions throughout. Um, it's just kind of a, a guide to kind of talk about some of the stuff I've been working on for the last, oh, I guess year, more than a year. So today I was asked to talk about um, our response to COVID-19 through research. Uh, and I'll specifically I'll talk about this Drexel SEPTA partnership related to COVID-19 that I've been working on and kind of leading uh, over the last year. So there's some noise, some kids outside. So if you don't hear them too much. Um, so I think we all know about COVID-19, but I thought I should at least put the slide up here and kind of harken back to like, the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, we started just learning about COVID-19, uh, which is short for coronavirus disease 2019. We heard something about it originating in Wuhan, China. Uh, the World Health Organization declared it a pandemic in March, and then everything just started to shut down. Um, but when I heard about COVID-19, I, I started to think about, okay, what's the, what's the virus? Um, and, and they named it Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, or SARS-CoV-2. You can see the image, kind of a cartoonish image of it on the top right. Uh, it's an envelope virus. It has spike proteins on the outside of it, and that's what they call it, corona. And there's kind of a, a picture, a microscope picture of it on the bottom right. So back then, if you can kind of remember back then, we're all getting used to Zoom. We're still doing it now. This is my colleagues in the Civil Architectural and Environmental Engineering Department. So we're all, I think this is one of our first faculty meetings uh, on Zoom. And I was also, we were also getting used to working from home. So this is my, he's now two and a half now, but this is a, he was a year and a half last year. So I had to get used to working with him uh, at home in my office. But also during this time, I, I started to think there's funding opportunities about COVID-19. Um, I never worked with viruses before. I was an environmental engineer. Uh, I also wear a hat of environmental microbiologist. I like to study microbes and see how they clean the environment, how they can remove pollution uh, and degrade things. But I started to think, how could I use my expertise to, to fight COVID-19? I mean, as an academic and, and needing to support my lab, I thought about all the research money that was being directed towards COVID-19, but I also thought about how can I help? Because it was almost a really hopeless uh, time last year. We didn't know what was going to happen. Some of us thought it might be over by end of June. Uh, some didn't know when it would end. Um, so I tried to think about ways that we could, I could use my expertise um, towards COVID-19 to fight the, the pandemic. And really early on, um, I was already part of this Neheim Plasma Institute, uh, which is headed by Alex Friedman. Uh, there's a research professor there, Alexander Rabinovich, and then Greg Friedman, who used to work at uh, Drexel, but now started a small business called A Plasma. Uh, and there's actually a PhD student, Charles Bailey, who's also works at A Plasma. Uh, and then Michael Waring in my department, who's now the department head of civil architectural environmental engineering. So we saw all these opportunities for funding uh, to, to fight COVID-19. And so we came up with some ideas and, and applied for some, some, some grant money to, um, to tackle COVID, some, some of the issues with COVID-19. And so one of the first things, because there was no uh, vaccine back then, uh, there was a lot of ideas of, of non-vaccine controls against COVID-19. So this is a hierarchy of controls against, um, against infectious diseases. Um, so the least effective, but which was pretty predominant early on is the use of PPE, especially for medical and healthcare workers. Um, there's also administrative controls, engineering controls, isolating people from the hazard, trying to eliminate the, the, the problem. So trying to inactivate SARS-CoV-2. And so we looked at this kind of thing and we thought based on some of the experience uh, of the people at the Plasma Institute was how could we use plasma to sterilize PPE? And so this isn't really related to SEPTA, but it kind of gets us into how I became acquainted with, with SEPTA. Um, as we all know, early on, um, first there was uh, some, some, some news and some information about not wearing masks because we want to you know, preserve the supply for 
medical care workers, healthcare workers. Um, but we learned that masks do reduce airborne transmission of droplets and aerosols. So droplets and aerosols are pretty much along a spectrum of different particle sizes, pretty much that we respire or sometimes um, spit out of our mouths. Um, and those can actually travel some distance. So the larger the size of the particles, uh, those droplets, they'll fall a lot faster, but the smaller they are, they can travel further. And so the coronavirus or SARS-CoV-2 is about 0 0.1 microns, um, but within our you know, respiratory droplets, it can be a lot larger. So they, they range in different sizes, um, but those really small ones can pretty much travel pretty far. So we know the importance of having to wear masks. And my wife's actually a, a, a surgeon. So I just remember early on, you know, all the stuff about uh, PPE shortages and wearing N95 masks and, and face shields and, and such, and how there was a, such a short supply and how she had to reuse hers quite a bit. Um, so with the people at the Plasma Institute, uh, we came up with the idea and submitted it to the Defense Logistics Agency. Um, and so the Defense Log Logistics Agency is really responsible for kind of moving stuff to all the different military bases and installations throughout the world. Um, and so the Plasma Institute and A Plasma had some prior funding uh, with the Defense Logistics Agency or DLA. And we actually applied for funding uh, to use plasma activated aerosols for N95 reuse. And so we applied for some funding early in April and we actually got funding and started this project on May 1st. And I won't describe too much of the science behind it, but I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions about it. Um, but basically we took some stuff off the shelf, um, pretty much a, a, a dish dryer and fabricated uh, with, um, with a surface DVD unit, this number three here, which can help produce um, reactive oxygen species, essentially things that can inactivate uh, living, living things like viruses or bacteria. And essentially you, what our idea was, was to put N95 masks and other PPE within this kind of area here and deliver some plasma activated fog to help kill the virus on, on the masks. And so we've carried out some studies. We actually worked with NextFab. So I don't know if any of you heard of NextFab in Philadelphia, um, but they, they're pretty much a maker space. They, they kind of teach you how to use uh, different type of machining tools, but they helped us build the first two couple prototypes. And then we worked with this uh, company called Cox Industrial Services um, because as part of this project, uh, the DLA wanted us to make a hundred within just three months. So it was quite a, quite a big ask, especially for a small team. Uh, but what I was involved in was pretty much studying if, if this actually killed viruses. So we didn't actually use SARS-CoV-2, but we used um, surrogates uh, of viruses uh, that are similar to SARS-CoV-2, but only infect bacteria. So they're pretty much safe uh, to work with. So this is an actual device that we had set up in our lab. We still have them in our lab. Uh, we're still doing some tests today. Um, but really it was uh, this PhD student, Jinji, who actually did a lot of the, the work. She's a real rock star and, and she's actually a big fan of Guns N' Roses. So we actually named some of our first uh, few prototype instruments, Axel and Slash, um, because of her love of Guns N' Roses. Um, but she did a lot of hard work trying to learn how to work with viruses. Our, our lab really didn't work with bacteriophages or viruses before, but she was, was up to the task to learn how to culture viruses and how to study them and how to study how we can, how this device actually could kill them. So that's kind of a, a side story, but while all that was happening, um, Greg at A Plasma, who's a Drexel alum, um, was actually in touch with the Philadelphia airport and SEPTA um, because they found out, you know, there was stuff going around of how can we actually kill uh, coronavirus or SARS-CoV-2. So there was a lot of things going around as using UV or other things. Um, but what SEPTA was dealing with at that time was, you know, in mid-March, they had to pretty much reduce their schedule and people just started, just stopped writing SEPTA. And really this uh, hurt them because it really destroyed one of their revenue streams, their main revenue streams. And so it really put them on unpresented, unprecedented financial challenge. Um, nobody was, everybody was working from home and even those who had to, um, there wasn't as many and it, they, their ridership pretty much dropped, um, I think down to 10 to 20% uh, 
in, in the months of April and May. And even as things started to open up during the summer, and even now, I think they're only up to about uh, 30%, uh, maybe a little bit higher than that for some of the lines. So they still, still are struggling trying to get riders back uh, onto SEPTA. So when we started talking to them in, in pretty much the end of April, we actually had our first Zoom call, our first discussion on May 12th of 2020. So it was between Drexel, SEPTA, and AE Plasma. And we started to hear that they had concerns about their low ridership and how they can regain the confidence of their riders to come back. Uh, the, the main focus initially was, you know, on kind of air disinfection technologies. But once we got to tour the, the, their, their facilities, we went to the Frankfurt Transportation Center um, at the end of May. And we actually talked to some of their employees and we got to see the buses. And it was amazing when we went to go see the buses, how clean the buses actually looked. I've never seen such a clean bus before in, in, in train cars, uh, but we saw all the stuff that they were doing. Uh, they were cleaning them pretty much every bus, every, I think every one or two days, like really deep cleaning and sterilizing them. And then pretty much after every route, they would kind of do a quick kind of wipe down of the, of, of the buses. And so they really changed their cleaning protocols. Uh, and you can see in the worker's face that, you know, this is their, their job, but they were also concerned as well. Um, so after that kind of meeting, we realized that it was more than just kind of air disinfection technologies. Um, and so we started to think about who else at Drexel could be involved in such a partnership um, beyond just the plasma folks and myself. Uh, and so we started thinking about people in the School of Public Health, um, people from the College of Medicine. Um, and, and so eventually we, we gathered up a team. We talked to the um, uh, Office of Research and Innovation. Uh, so we talked to Alistair Saunders uh, and some other people, and we actually uh, came up with a proposal for a partnership between Drexel and SEPTA. That we actually sent them, took some time, but by, by the beginning of July. And so when we actually went to SEPTA, to the Frankfurt station, we saw them cleaning, and so they really en enhanced their cleaning protocols. And they looked at a whole bunch of different types of uh, disinfecting solutions uh, that they could use, but it was surprising to me to learn that um, their safety team at, at SEPTA actually did a lot of research to find out, you know, what was actually effective. So they had some ongoing studies to see which cleaning uh, solutions were effective and um, which ones were EPA approved and, and so far, uh, so forth. But still, they needed some help. They, they couldn't kind of understand some of the data that they were sending out to some commercial labs of, say, disinfection of um, some bacteria. Um, so they really wanted our, our expertise our help with kind of looking at some of the, the data that they were collecting from their studies. They also, because of, you know, federal and local kind of um, guidance and, and mandates, um, you know, required mask wearing on, on public transportation, on the on buses, trolleys, uh, and, and the trains. Uh, and they also instituted other things like um, promoting the use of the set the key, um, key card, practicing social distancing as well. And they actually had some people out, I think in, in the fall, uh, um, kind of um, not enforcers, but people that would kind of remind people to, to social distance. They had people uh, carry on masks uh, just in case they didn't have masks. So they really tried to, I think they had one bad incident where they, they kicked some, some people off a bus. But I think after that, um, they just tried to encourage people and, and supply people with masks uh, when they saw that they weren't wearing it. And they actually have some video that they've collected um, of, of, of some buses and some routes where they can actually see the mass compliance. Uh, and I think um, from some data late in the fall, they were showing that compliance was pretty much above 90% on most, most routes. Uh, so most people were kind of following those, those guidelines. So I don't want you to read all this text here. There's some underlying stuff here, but in that proposal that we sent for the partnership, um, we really wanted to look at customer perception and behavior and see why they weren't riding public transit and what, you know, what those factors were and how can we uh, actually regain their confidence in, in riding public transportation. Uh, we also want to look at um, exposure routes uh, or transmission routes and what those risks are of, of those different transmission uh, scenarios. And we wanted to apply uh, quantitative microbial risk assessment framework uh, to kind of study those risks, uh, both in, in cabins and in the vehicles uh, of, of, of SEPTA. 
Uh, and then we also want to look at different indicators uh, used to assess the effectiveness of decontamination processes. So they were testing some solutions and stuff like that, cleaning solutions, and they were sending it to labs, but they, they didn't know what indicators to use, uh, what, what bacteria they should be kind of looking at or viruses uh, that would give them the right information. And then they also wanted to uh, have us test and develop kind of uh, cost-effective disinfection technologies and risk mitigation strategies. So not just UV um, and ozone, for instance, but maybe improve ventilation or filtration that could reduce transmission risks of COVID-19. So just a, a few key dates. So after we sent that, that proposal, uh, at the end of July, we had actually a pretty big meeting uh, with people from SEPTA and Drexel. There was probably about um, 20 people from Drexel, uh, faculty and kind of upper administration that attended it. And there was quite a few, probably a dozen or so, uh, people from SEPTA. So it's pretty quite big uh, to begin with. Uh, so people from the School of Public Health, College of Engineering, College of Medicine um, that attended uh, that meeting. And then it took a little while longer, but uh, eventually there was an MOU that was executed for the partnership. So it's actually um, kind of outlines a little bit of the details for the research partnership. And then one of the biggest things that happened, I think, in the fall was um, we saw that no on November 2nd, there was a due date, and that's when it was due. Actually, I saw this uh, announcement in October um, that uh, there was a call for, for proposals by the Department of Transportation and the Federal Transit Administration uh, for COVID-19. So we applied for that funding on November 2nd. So actually what that call was uh, is kind of detailed here, but you can just look at the red text. Um, so they were looking at, they were, they were interested in, in projects related to public transportation and COVID-19. Um, and really we focused on kind of vehicle, facility and equipment and infrastructure cleaning and disinfection, which SEPTA was already doing. Uh, but we were kind of telling them that um, surfaces, cleaning surfaces probably weren't the only thing they should be concerned about would also air, um, air kind of filtration and air ventilation. And so we also wanted to, to look at those as kind of mitigation strategies, as well as what's already was in place, the, the mask wearing in social distance and see how that actually reduced exposure. So we applied to this funding opportunity on November 2nd. And, and the title of our proposal was Mass Transit Vehicle Air Ventilation and Purification Technologies Evaluation. Um, these are just a few of the people from, uh, the main people from Drexel that uh, are part of this project. A lot of them are from my department. Uh, so James Lowe, Michael Waring, and Chuck Haas, as well as Alex Freeman from Mechanical Engineering and the Plasma Institute. Uh, and then here's some people from SEPTA. But really the, our goal for this project was to assess different vehicle facility equipment and infrastructure cleaning and disinfection strategies, and also to assess uh, exposure mitigation measures and how effective they were. And then how this data that we collected from these studies would eventually strengthen the public confidence in, in transit and coming back to mass transit. So here's a little kind of diagram that I came up to describe the, the project. So really the central part of it is are these simulations or computer models to understand COVID-19 transmission risk and modeling. And so those were CFD models, so computational fluid dynamic models, as well as cabin-wide well-mixed models and simulations. But in order to run those simulations, we needed information on, say, the vehicles, the routes, so how long people were staying on those routes for, how often were the doors opening and closing, uh, and also what kind of uh, ventilation systems they had in each of the vehicles and how they were ran under different conditions, say in the winter and versus the summer. Uh, what was the mask wearing and social distance compliance, distancing compliance that was happening. So we can kind of model those, those, those scenarios. But we also wanted to look at air purification technology. So doing laboratory testing. Uh, so that was going to be done by a plasma and people at Drexel, especially the people at Plasma Institute and myself. And we actually wanted to put some sensors in some actual vehicles. So do some cabin testing to validate the models that we were going to run. And hopefully this would kind of inform us on kind of what were the best mitigation strategies. And so we're gonna to try to do cost benefit analyses so we can make some industry recommendation, recommendations on how, what, how effective these different mitigation strategies are at reducing COVID-19 risks. 
Uh, so it's a two-year project that we got funded for. Uh, we found out that we were awarded the project in January. Um, we've kind of started some of the work already. The contract is still being finalized, um, but it was awarded directly to SEPTA and we're a subcontract on, and the main player pretty much on, on the project. So there was actually 37 projects nationwide uh, and, and the Department of Transportation have funded about $16 million to those 37 projects. Uh, most of them are about a year to two year projects. And it was kind of a new type of project for FTA. So they're kind of learning how to do these. Usually they do things like, you know, um, what are the best fare systems or maybe like safety features, for instance, for bike lanes and stuff like that. And so really COVID-19 projects was really out of their their realm. So they're also learning how to actually kind of manage these projects as well and, and define what the expectations are. Um, but a little bit about kind of what SEPTA has been doing and kind of related to our project. Um, I've, I've mentioned some of it already is the COVID-19 transmission and risk is a major part of the project. Uh, and just a few things about COVID-19 transmission. Um, there's basically two main routes. There's the first route is by touch, and I think that's what everyone obsessed with. So I actually looked up some articles, and some people call it hygiene theater. Everyone getting the sanitation wipes, wiping everything down, bleaching everything, um, because they're worried that if a contaminated, uh, infected person touched the surface, that you might come by and touch it and, and get infected. The other route is through air, airborne kind of transmission. Um, sometimes they break it up between droplet-borne route, short-range airborne route and long range, but you can just kind of think of it all together as airborne transmission. It really depends on the size of the droplets, how far those droplets will, will move. Um, and so really in the bottom bullet point, you can see that the, the, the major type of transmission, or at least people are, there's growing evidence that airborne transmission uh, is definitely more important than full mite or surface transmission. Now, SEPTA, just like the rest of the world, really focus on enhanced cleaning protocols on this fomite or surface transmission. So they have those enhanced cleaning protocols and a lot of transit agencies throughout the country have um, kind of implemented them and adopted them. And, and they're very hesitant to give that up because I think people like to see that it's clean and they're always cleaning the, the, the surfaces and, and sanitizing. Um, so in addition to their enhanced cleaning, like I said before, uh, they, they required social distancing and mask wearing. I think you might have seen on as of June 1st, there's no longer any social distancing requirements on, on SEPTA. Uh, but I think to follow the federal guidelines, they're, they're making mask wearing mandatory at least until September, unless there's any other changes uh, with, with, with any regulations or guidance um, from the government. So there's transmission and risks. And, and that was actually, I, I went ahead, but that's really going to be led by Chuck Haas in our department, who's pretty much an expert in quantitative microbial risk assessment. And then for airflow and ventilation, uh, we're working with associate professor. He's just recently promoted uh, and, and received tenure, uh, James Lowe. So really the concept here is since we're focused on airborne kind of transmission uh, and we're thinking of SARS-CoV-2 as airborne particles, they're pretty much move around space uh, spaces based on airflow, um, unless they're kind of deposited on surfaces. So really to understand how they move in closed spaces, such as subway cars, you kind of have to know the ventilation, how air moves through there. So that's really what James is going to be focusing on doing computational fluid dynamics, understand how air moves within these, these cabins, whether they're buses, trolleys, or they're train cars. And so one of the things you might've heard uh, in some articles or online is this, this abbreviation ACH or air changes per hour. And so that's pretty much how much air kind of goes in and out uh, of one of these closed spaces within an hour. So really what the goal is for, one of the goals for James is kind of establishing what's the optimal air changes per hour to, to keep people safe within these, these, um, these vehicles. Uh, if you actually go to this New York Times article where this image is from, um, the number of air changes per hour actually in subway cars is extremely high, um, surprisingly, um, because of the ventilation and because of kind of the opening and closing of the doors uh, for these subway cars. So they're, they're, they're pretty high within, the, within, within a lot of these uh, vehicles. And another thing that we're, we're focusing on in the project 
is really how particles are removed or where they come from, uh, airborne particles within enclosed spaces. So this is, shows a, a house here, but you can kind of think of any kind of closed space. And there's going to be sources, emission sources. There's going to be different activities that might degrade those compounds or change the compounds or, or viruses uh, within there. So there's resuspension, there's deposition. You might have filtration as well and stuff coming in uh, from outdoors. And so really what we hope to do is to kind of model different sources uh, in vehicles, maybe symptomatic people, asymptomatic. They might have different kind of um, source patterns. Uh, and then the source, uh, the amount that comes from each might be different if they're mass versus unmass. And then we'll also be looking at kind of different ways of removing viruses, whether they're filtration or air disinfection. Um, and one thing that SEPTA has been doing, they're, they're definitely starting to look more into their ventilation. They have a team looking at, at air, uh, kind of air purification technologies and such in their vehicles is that actually move from MERV 8 to MERV 13 filters. So MERV 8 or these MERV rating pretty much tells you the kind of effectiveness of these filters. So they originally had MERV 8, so they were good at removing kind of big things like lint, pollen, dust, mold. Um, and they moved to MERV 13, which actually can remove uh, some viruses and, and, and bacteria um, pretty well. So they actually have made effort to kind of change their filters to improve the air quality uh, within, within their vehicles. Now, the last thing that we want to look at is air disinfection technologies. And, and really, initially, we wanted to see if maybe plasma could be used, but I think a lot of what's being advertised is snake oil. So even though the, the expertise of this team is, is, is plasma technologies, and a lot of technologies that are out there on the market are based on, surprisingly, plasma. Um, but a lot of it's probably snake oil. Um, they, we don't really know if they are effective. A lot of the data from them are from are from the vendors themselves. Um, even if they do hire a commercial lab to run some of the tests, it's really questionable how kind of reliable that data is. So we're really gonna kind of evaluate some of these technologies, uh, especially the ones that uh, seem to be kind of popular. And then another thing that we wanna look at with these disinfection, disinfection technologies is if they pose any risks. So a lot of these things, whether they're UV, for instance, UV, uh, could be bad if you're exposed to, so you can get burns from it. Uh, UV kind of burns like almost like from being outside for too long. So there's there's risks with that, with, with UV type uh, disinfecting technologies. And even other ones that use say bipolar ionization or, um, or that use plasma can produce, for instance, ozone or some other, um, other things that might be dangerous. So we wanna see if they actually pose other risks. And so they might be more detrimental than helpful, even though they can kill um, coronavirus. So that's kind of what we'll be doing for the next um, two years or year and a half, two years uh, with that project. Um, but I think because uh, SEPTA, you know, the 34th Street Station and 30th Street Station are so close and pretty much on campus, um, there might be other ways beyond COVID-19 that this uh, SEPTA Drexel partnership might go and kind of develop on this kind of research partnership uh, where we team up with them to do uh, research. Um, so there might be some more opportunities in the future. So that's kind of a kind of a little bit of tidbit on, on what the partnership is. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have on, on the partnership. So I'll stop my share and be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Let me start. Do you have any preliminary insights or results, or are you really just getting started and setting up? Do you have anything that actually had them change? Did any of your research had effect change in their procedures? Or their so we're we're just one of the deliverables for our project is a three month lit review um, of what people have studied, and there actually hasn't been much studied as far as public transportation. For instance, even like mass compliance and social distancing compliance is actually only one study out of Ghana that was conducted last year. So there's, I think there's a lot of transit agencies that are collecting data, but a lot of it's not published. Um, and I think there's growing evidence we're finding, for instance, that we said that fomite transmission is not important or surface transmission. So a lot of the focus of SEPTA has been really refocused towards kind of this air ventilation, air purification 
type strategy. So we're still we're still at the very beginning. <laughs> Any other questions? Trick another one, and maybe some of our colleagues in the library <clears throat> would like to jump in with some more detail on this. But I'm sort of curious, when when did when was the shift made? What the at the very beginning? I know in our field internationally, there was there was uh, some systematic research being done on the question of how long the virus would remain on particular types of surfaces, and <clears throat> and what it was focusing on was the various surfaces that appear in libraries. So obviously books, you know, the, the organic papers and, and glass surfaces and the like. And, and from that fairly quickly, at least some recommendations were made to quarantine those materials. We were quarantine books. And, and I think there was a little bit of debate and I think our research team was asked to comment and didn't really give a decisive reaction to it. But <clears throat> I think some of the similar um, questions, of how, do you, how do you even begin to understand the impact of that? And I'm wondering if, if there was some change. Yeah, I think there was an early study, you know, early on in the pandemic that showed how long that coronavirus can last and live on certain surfaces, certain different types of materials. And I think it kind of gave the misconception um, that that was kind of the ma major thing that we had to worry about uh, was, was contaminated surfaces. But I think it was kind of misleading, actually, um, and, and led people to buy a lot of bleach and, and I think even a lot of the things that were being sold to places like SEPTA and hotels and restaurants were like fogging machines and electric sprayers to kind of spray surfaces. Um, but one of the things that we were looking at is, you know, what was the data that they were producing? Um, and one of the things I think most of you might have heard is when we all get tested for, for COVID-19 is they do often a PCR test. Um, and on surfaces, when they do that PCR test, they really can't differentiate between live and dead virus. So even if there was a dead virus, but their genomic material is still around, it'll still count it as being there. So really depending on who was doing the study and how they were doing it, if they weren't actually trying to test for live viruses, uh, some of the data might've been misleading as far as how long they actually can survive. Um, so I think there was actually studies from like the, was that the Princess Cruise Line? And they actually detected on some of the filters, like the air filters, uh, viruses, and they swiped some surfaces. But a lot of those were PCR tests and they weren't actually detecting like live virus. So even though they did detect the DNA or RNA of it, it was, it was a little misleading because it didn't really say if it was actually live virus that could infect someone. So that's what that's what we're kind of weeding through right now, and there's actually not too much information out there. Yeah, the library studies um, just said whether it was the virus was detectable or not. I don't remember them being more specific than that. And uh, we just we held on to our practices until the CDC announced that um, there was no need to clean everything, to disinfect or sanitize everything all the time. That like doing that once a day was enough. Um, I just sort of remember along with the library stuff, I knew people that didn't touch their mail for a week and, you know, they would bring it in and let us sit there. People concerned about groceries, that whole period that we went through. Yeah, it, it really depends on people's, you know, what they accept as tolerable as far as risk. Mm -hmm. Hi, hi, Chris. Um, I was wondering, uh, you know, uh, some of the places that you go into will will scan your forehead for fever. Uh, has SEPTA ever done that? Or is there even any evidence that that really helps um, if you, you know, refuse entr entry of people with fever? Yeah, I don't know if SEPTA has. They've never brought it up, so I don't think they have done that. Um, but I know it, it's problematic because, you know, there's asymptomatic, presymptomatic, and symptomatic people, and only symptomatic people, only some symptomatic people will show fever, not everyone. So, and even presymptomatic or asymptomatic people could still spread it. Um, so it's not a foolproof method as far as kind of limiting your exposure. Yeah. 
Um, I was uh, I was really interested in actually the in the flow of um, how the partnerships were created, and then getting the point of you know uh, applying for the the grant and that. Um, not implying that anything you know that there were any partners that were too slow or anything. How was that timeline compared to non COVID related partnership work that you might have been involved with? This is probably the first time I've been involved in anything this big, <laughs> um, but I think I think it's probably the norm. But I don't know how normal this was. I think there was definitely a lot of interest from both sides. Um, but I think all that paperwork it, it slowed up things a little bit. <laughs> Hi, Doctor Salas. Hey, Isa. Um. This is one of my PhD on, students, by the way. <laughs> I have a question on um, sort of the transfer of knowledge. So I'm assuming that other major cities have similar research being done on the effectiveness on like, the airflow in the public transportation. How do you see the knowledge being spread from different cities and how the conclusions from this research can be utilized by other cities or worldwide? So what I've heard is that um, like vehicles from city to city might be different, um, but there are definitely like, like for instance, our, our, I think our regional rail and our subway cars are definitely specific to cities. Usually they're really specific to cities, but I think for buses, um, buses are, you know, you have similar models from city to city. So I think that's kind of transferable. I think there's general things that could be transferable too. Um, I'm not really sure how, the FTA, especially with all those 37 projects, I'm not sure if they're all related to specifically what kind of like what we're doing, um, but hopefully they're, they're thinking of ways to bring us together and sharing information eventually. Um, I'm, a, I'm a part of some other research communities that have that are, that are kind of um, all the funding comes from pretty much one funding source and they've done a good job, at least in those circumstances of bringing people together to share knowledge. So hopefully FTA does that at, at some point. I know we're going to try to publish not only in academic journals, but also industry kind of publications as well and industry venues, conferences and such. So hopefully we can have some, you know, wide, wider spread dissemination, not just to academia, but also to the practitioners. And then I think they also, SEPTA also wants to, their big focus is, is really kind of advertising to people that SEPTA is COVID safe. And so really communicating it to the public is really important to them. Um, they're dying for us to give them information, but as academics, we're all, all, always weary too. But we want to make sure that there's always a caveat with some of the stuff that we find. I suspect that's the kind of thing that will lead at some point, maybe or maybe not, to sort of you know guidelines like we have you know in architecture, the lean levels of, of safety yeah. or so. And and I would imagine it's. When I'm thinking of transportation, yesterday I was in a cab in another city, and and immediately I got in, the, and the cab driver said, "I have my first shot. I'm about to have my second. Uh, but he had his whole, you know, he had his protective shield around between him and me, and and I walked in from a place they didn't have to wear a mask, and he said, uh, "Do you have a mask? Because I can't give you a ride without." I said, oh my gosh, I forgot. You know, he had a whole bunch ready to give me in case not. So I wonder if some of the other kinds of um, um, Transportation, you know, cabs, Ubers. Um, well, I guess bicycles are out in the open, but uh, as you said, there's the air, uh, the cruise lines. I guess that's going to be a really interesting area of accumulation of a lot of people. But um, yeah, I know, I know James. He works with um, NIST, which I think it's I forget that what the I stands for, but I think it's like kind of a standards uh, for buildings and stuff and measuring things. Um, but he's been talking to them about vehicle codes and they have building codes for like what the ventilation requirements are and and the vehicle codes they're not really defined on on good science they're kind of just um arbitrary <laughs> to say the least but and so really hopefully we're hoping that some of the work that we do and so, some of the work other people do can really define those standards a little bit better and make sure that they're they're meaningful standards that are being applied to say ventilation and filtration and such for vehicles Dr. Salas, I just wanted to say that a takeaway for me is that um, I'm excited to know that you guys are working on this. Um, and uh, now I just 
connected with filling out a septic questionnaire a couple of times. That must have been motivated by um, by that work. Um, no, we definitely we work with the people that that put those together, and and they're also interested in working with the people from the school of public health, like Esther and and people like Enclair, um, kind of developing those 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 surveys a little bit better, and interpreting the data as well. Yeah, I think I think it's going to be also there's the whole field of how do you change public perception and how you change customer perceptions, uh, either of safety or quality or whatever factors are important to them. Because, um, and I know even among our staff, have, as we have had, maybe some of you are, are uh, interested in posing some questions, is how, how do you go about it? Because not everybody uh, resonates with facts. Sometimes it's an emotional reaction or you know a neighbor will tell them or who do they trust in terms of listening to and so, uh, I think that's going to be a very interesting component of your of your uh, research. Too. How do you change public opinion? Yeah, definitely. The team that's working on the project is very, you know, a lot of science scientists and engineers, and we're really we've actually brought into some of the meetings people from Westfall who are you know experts in kind of wayfair like wayfinding and kind of communications like graphical abstract communications type stuff and. We're talking to people from this, you know, the school of business about how to market and advertise those things. So we're hoping that, you know, to some degree that the this partnership will expand, not just you know, beyond kind of the, the engineers that are currently working on this project to other schools, because I think their their expertise is also needed as well. I think too, there's some people in COAS the, in the communications fields too that are involved also in this dissemination of information. That's also an information science topic of interest to how do you get science information to practice um, so maybe another area well this is this has been a really timely and very interesting project and i, I joined john and others to say thank you for for doing this and sharing this with us today and um we have a few minutes but let me i know several people have other places to go but um uh we do have a tradition afterwards of uh, mingling and chatting but uh, before people run off, it's been starting to show. Let's give let's give Chuck, uh, Chris a round of applause, however you want to do it virtually or in, in, in visual form to mute. So thank you so much for doing this. Okay. Uh, and I invite, uh, as we say, we it's certainly not the same as mingling and chatting in person with a refreshment in hand, but I invite anyone interested to stay for a few more minutes in our Zoom room for um, a virtual sort of happy hour, just maybe to touch... Uh, uh, comments among ourselves or text some of others, uh, some of Chris's others interests, other interests, which are certainly pretty broad here. Um, some of our other events have unexpectedly uncovered this after party conversation. Some really delightful insights what cross department and even cross border activities might be might be underway instead of in, in spite of this pandemic. So hope many of you can stay and practice some of those rusty uh, social gathering chit chat skills that we haven't really been able to do for quite a while. So again, I know several might go, but um, just if uh, there's fewer, just open up your mute and feel free to chat a little bit. So thanks again a lot, Chris, this has been terrific. Thanks, Anuda. Yep. Yeah, I think so, we might, there might be some still. <laughs> We've learned to leave the recording on for this. Yeah. Springtime, I feel like, is always hard. Finals week, it's hot. Vacations. <clears throat> Definitely hot. <laughs> yeah. But These folks might not be nearby at the moment, the ones yeah. that are still on. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I know some yeah. people live in Jersey, and so there's also the different transportation um, agencies must have a different approach. So in this area, we've got so many different... Um, yeah, we've been doing some... Some stuff, and it looks like in Texas, like there wasn't as big of a drop in ridership during the early months, but like places like DC and New York and Philadelphia, they had a big drop. Um, and so they kind of looked at like who was actually riding it, you know, like the actual like um, demographics of it to see why. Yeah. As I say, yesterday weekend, I went to DC and I took Amtrak, and it was the first time I and I take Amtrak a lot, usually before the pandemic, and I it was my first, I realized it was my first time for over a year. And, and you know, they've been, they've been going for some time. I had some other friends that took it a little earlier during the pandemic and were very, very nervous about doing it, thinking it's, it was going to be crowded and, and the like. Um, but there was something intuitively I felt safe. 
And I think it's because they didn't, they, you know, you did have to wear a mask that they did enforce um, in the station and in the cars. But beyond that, it was pretty much self, your own sen self sense of um, comfort. You did, people were sitting together. You know, at first everybody was sitting only one and people were traveling by themselves. But pretty soon you had to be standing. So, and they were, people were welcome. But again, in both directions, I was at the point, I had to ask somebody, could I sit there? And their answer included, I'm vaccinated. You know, so that is sort of like a pass. And one of the people I sat to in one direction was, uh, when you say Texas from Austin, as a young uh, uh, software engineer, but originally from India and recently from India. And so he's a foreign student. And, and he was just saying how it's dumb different here. Even in Texas. Everybody gets into a car there and they don't have the transportation issues for dealing with it. But um, yeah, his first comment was, I'm, I'm vaccinated in part, and just sort of looked at me like, yeah, are you? <laughs> so it's sort of interesting. Yeah, I, have my, I went to the, my first restaurant over the weekend, at least as far as like not being masked. So it was, it was a little un unusual for me, <laughs> especially being in the city. It's, in the city, it's quite different, I think. Yeah, yeah. Do you have any sense, do you think afterwards people will still be wearing masks? I mean, d d has the habit? Yeah, well, my, my wife is a ear, nose, and throat doctor and ah. she definitely saw a lot less like you know of those kind of respiratory illnesses over the winter so there's definitely a benefit to wearing them <laughs> and there's certainly other cultures that do it anyway they've done it before the pandemic it's not unusual to see people wearing masks so i sort of think it makes sense i think i'll keep my mask and can you have them and yeah I always i'll always have one in my bag <laughs> yeah. 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 if it extends to like a cultural change where people just are more aware of when they're sick themselves or that others might be and change some of our habits. And if, you know, if the research shows better ways to, you know, ways to improve cleaning and ventilation and stuff that we can do, I think that'll be a, you know, a, a collateral benefit of a very difficult situation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think people, because the first major outbreak in the U S was in New York, I think people thought it was a subway system, but you know, I think it was just kind of mis, mis, misleading or misguided kind of media stuff. What do you think uh, it was started there? Huh? If it wasn't, if, what do you think it was? It wasn't. Uh, well, I mean, I think it's, I think it brought people there, right, from other places that were infected. But I think yeah. on yeah. public transportation itself, it's probably not, um, hmm. you know, not a place where it was transmitted. I think it moved people to a certain place from other places together. And they actually convened in other places, <laughs> not really, because people only spend, you know, 15 minutes on the bus. So it might not be long enough to be exposed, even like on the, like, um, on the, you know, market Frayford line, you know, you're only on there maybe a couple stops. So you're only on there for like seven minutes. So is it really long enough? And the doors, doors are always opening and closing. <laughs> huh. So it's not just sort of like if you're in the line of a, Oh, virus going and it happens to hit you, you're likely to get it. It's it's perhaps more uh, more exposure. It's not, it's not yeah, bad. yeah. I think that's that's why it's good to have Chuck on the team because he does like dose response modeling. Like it, it takes a certain amount of dose to oh, okay. have so much risk. And my, you'll be able to tell which survey answers are for me if you ever look at them now. But <laughs> my answer was always based on I don't know what kinds of things you've ever seen happen on SEPTA, but my concern was less the environment, but the the random other person who just doesn't act the way that most people act in public. So you know, someone who's who's animated, who pulls their wrap their mask on, who seems agitated even though there's no one that they're having an argument with and like being stuck in a SEPTA vehicle with that person pre-vaccination times. That was my concern. But what it led to was um, habits that actually impact SEPTA, SEPTA because until it got really hot, I was still walking to work. And it's I, this is not the humble brag. This is just talking about my habit change, but it's 2.8 miles for me each way. And, you know, that was great. I'm like, oh, I'm going to keep walking to work. It's going to be healthy. I can make this change because I did it during the pandemic until it got really, really hot. <laughs> and I just, you know, it's just too much. I can't walk in and be covered in sweat. The gym's not open. You can't go in the locker room and like get cleaned up. For so, um, you know, my habits have changed some and I want to try to hold on to that part. And it's not really about SEPTA. It's about um, a different change for me that was related to my commute. 
Yeah, it's, I mean, it's been hard for them because they, they rely on kind of fitting people on these small cars and fitting a lot of people, moving a lot of people um, in a short amount of time or with not too many vehicles. And so kind of the whole social distancing was kind of like the total opposite. I think the mask wearing, not too bad, but and I think they'll be able to prove that the ventilation on there is pretty good. So the opportunity, I think, for them is that they can change their routes now because they don't have, you know, the same engagement with the current routes since there are fewer people using them. And a lot of the routes are based on um, uh, sort of demographic changes in Philly, like um, the Route 40 bus. I used to live in Winfield. And I thought, why is there this crazy bus route? And it was because people that had used to live on South Street had moved to the Winfield area. And so there's this one route that wins its way through North Philly, I mean, West Philly, and then it takes this turn and goes up around. It's sort of like a big L shape. And a friend of mine who's a Philly historian explained where old neighborhoods moved to become new neighborhoods and stuff. And the routes were just connecting those people, but they're no longer related. You know, the the grandchildren are not using those bus routes now. Um, We're just stuck with them. And Philly has announced that they're looking to do more, I would call them New York style or Manhattan style routes where you just go north and south or east and west, shuttle people around, bring them to subway entrances. Um, And it's an opportunity if people aren't really wedded to the current bus routes because they're not riding. Um, I'm sure that the subway is not going to change the same. <laughs> well, there are any other comments or questions. It's really been terrific, Chris. Thanks so much for doing it. Well, thanks for inviting me. So, yeah, thank, thank you for all for coming and stay safe for your, yep, another year off. This is what, our 10th year for doing this? <laughs> it'll be 10 next year, so we'll have to do, yep, it'll be, be a big one. We can have a big, hopefully, you know, start 10 years off with, uh, an in-person version. I hope so. Be nice, to have, or it'll be hybrid. We'll have some. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Oh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. The new, the new definition of life is hybrid. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, guys. Good luck with finishing off this term, and look forward to seeing you. All right. Have a good summer. See you all. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.